I went up to uh, Malcolm X Boulevard in Harlem on election day, and the young people who were going in, the 18 and 19 year olds, to go in for the first time to vote was remarkable. One of the older people we interviewed saying, I feel a part of this country for the first time, like I'm in the center of it. The screaming, the shouts in the street as I was driving through Times Square at one in the morning, it could have been New Year's Eve. And so you had this huge effort, the Obama campaign, I mean, they mobilized on the ground and online in a way we have never seen before. Incredibly sophisticated, organized, they have 10 million names. I was getting texts on my phone every few hours. It always signed Barack. <laughs> and, but at the same time, Tremendous resources, financial resources, were used to do this. I mean, tremendous. The amount of money spent on this campaign is unheard of. We're talking billions of dollars. And to the shock of the Republicans, it was not the Republicans who were raising most of it. It was the Democrats, right? Barack Obama decided to opt out of our campaign finance reform system. The lesson to the Republicans, I heard Newt Gingrich speaking a few weeks ago saying, you know, he hated campaign finance reform. Remember, it was McCain-Feingold. And he said, now we can finally do away with it. Of course this was wrong. Well, let that not be the lesson of what happened, because there are cross currents right now. On the one hand, you have the phenomenal community organizing. But on the other hand, you have the phenomenal amounts of money that were raised and spent. And now you have these currents clashing. Because here, are, here is everyone ready to go. But who will organize them? That's one question, right? The campaign has been organizing them. What will happen to those 10 million names, the texts and the emails? Well now, people who've been organizing against the state to elect Barack Obama, he becomes the state. And what does everyone do? The last message I got just before he came out in Grant Park in Chicago, right, when it was announced he had won, they certainly sent out a message. And it said, you know, wait, for your next message, we've only just begun. But it is not now for people to wait for getting that message on high. It is for people to organize. In every sense right now, it has just begun, right? The match has been lit, we can't let it go out. Grassroots movements are more important than ever. There may be a bigger opening right now, but that doesn't mean all that you want to see will be accomplished, or even half or a quarter of it. I mean, you look at right now, Barack Obama is hunkered down in Chicago, developing his economic team. And who is he surrounding himself with? Well, the very same people that raise these obscene amounts of money. Um, it was Barack Obama and John McCain who both voted for the bailout to the tune of something over $800 billion. I actually think John McCain would have won if he had voted against it. I was shocked that he didn't because he was coming into Washington, he was suspending his campaign. You thought some big moment would happen, but they just couldn't buck the people who were filling their coffers, their pockets. And where is that money going now? unaccounted for billions are being given out from the bottom to the top to bail out the corporate titans they're talking about you know a, a significant amount of money is now going to year-end bonuses believe it or not but don't worry they won't be getting as much of a bonus as they would have before the bi millions for each individual it'll be a little lower it's up to people to put pressure during one of the early debates, um, 
the Democratic candidates were asked when they were vying with each other who would Martin Luther King support. And Hillary Clinton said me, said her. John Edwards said me, said him. And Barack Obama said none of us. He wouldn't be supporting a presidential candidate. And I think that's very important to understand at this point. The power of grassroots movements and privately, he might want some of this pressure because when they surround him and they make their demands, the people, I mean, millions of people gave small amounts of money. That was unprecedented. But also a small number of people gave millions of dollars. And that also was unprecedented. And they're the ones who know their way through the West Wing. They're the ones who know exactly where to go. They're the ones who have the ear immediately of the highest officials of the land. And if there isn't a counterforce, if there isn't some tremendous pressure outside that he can say, if I do that, they will storm the Bastille, <laughs> things won't really change. And it's also why we need community media. Because we need to have a forum unfettered, open, a global forum to discuss and debate the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death. We need to be able to have these discussions across the political spectrum, the socioeconomic spectrum, the racial divide, the digital divide, everyone included. We've got to think outside the box because the the whole earth is at stake right now. It is that serious. And those kinds of discussions don't happen in the corporate media. We have to challenge them absolutely to go beyond the spectrum that they revolve in, that they live in, which is between the Democrats and the Republicans. And so often there is so little spectrum you can't even find the difference between them. Let's not forget in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq. It wasn't just the Republicans that authorized the war. It never would have happened. Yes, Bush was gung-ho, but he had the leading Democrats, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry. They're talking about him for Secretary of State right now, John Edwards. They all voted for the invasion. And so what we got on television was almost not, no difference. And yet most people were outside of that spectrum. You know, those who are opposed to war, those who are opposed to torture, are not a fringe minority, not a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, and we have to take it back. The media are the most powerful institutions on earth, more powerful than any bomb, more powerful than any missile, and the Pentagon has deployed the media we have to take it back. This is where we have the global conversation. It's got to happen in a forum that is not there to push forward a corporate agenda. The non-corporate microphones of CKUT, the non-corporate lenses of community television, in the United States, it's called public access TV. It's so important, fought for, just like community radio was fought for. When the telecoms, when the cable companies come into a town and dig up the roads, only one gets to lay down the cable. That's how it's been in the past, so that the roads aren't dug up all the time and they get a monopoly. But the media activists fought back and said, if you get a monopoly, we get some channels. That was the deal. And so there are public interest channels in every city and every town. Some people don't even know that they have the right to activate those channels. They lie dormant in communities, and the cable companies have to pay for them. Um, but these stations, radio and television, are critical all over the world to give voice to the grassroots, authentic voices that are fighting at a community level for 
greater equality, for peace in their own communities. These are the voices that are the most believable because they're going through the pain. They're at the target end of policy, and that's where our microphones and our cameras should be.